Hi, um, good morning. Um, my name is uh, Bernhard Rieder um, and I've been invited to give uh, a lecture uh, on, uh, on my work in the context of uh, this uh, course and also to reflect a bit about uh, the relationship between the digital humanities and uh, media studies. Um, and, and that's a pretty tall order, right? Uh, those are um, pretty large fields um, that do uh, all kinds of uh, quite different things. So um, I was thinking like, mm, how, can I, uh, how can I best uh, uh, do this? Um, and I thought maybe the easiest way uh, is to approach the question through uh, my own work. Um, and this is why I have called this talk uh, Probing a Platform to a Media System. It's um, part of uh, um, a larger research project that I've been working on with colleagues for a couple of years already on, uh, on YouTube. Um, and um, yeah, I hope uh, this is uh, interesting for you and I'm going to be trying to think about, you know, more structurally about that relationship between uh, the digital humanities and media studies throughout the, the talk. Um, but I really wanted to start with something a bit personal, right? So that you understand like where I'm coming from, what I'm interested in. And um, when I was a student, um, initially, my interest was in becoming a, a journalist. Uh, so I was very always interested very much in, uh, in uh, the media and I'm originally Austrian. So, um, um, you know, that uh, um, historical uh, baggage of national socialism that uh, we are carrying uh, uh, with us was always um, a real interest to me um, um, and so uh, I enrolled in uh, university in communications and uh, history and um, yeah throughout my studies there I, uh, I discovered uh, the, um, the guy you see here on the uh, next to me uh, uh, Michel Foucault uh, who's uh, whose work on, on power was a real eye-opener for me. And it was um, really a moment of, uh, of, of great discovery. So Foucault is somebody who thinks about power in uh, not just this uh, terms of, um, you know, uh, um, like governmental power, but power is something that really runs through us. Um, and these two interests, uh, the media on the one side and, and power on the other side, are really the foundations of of what I'm interested in uh, today in uh, my work. Um, but uh, I also, uh, I was always interested very much in, uh, in computers. I learned uh, programming as a, as, a, as a kid. And then uh, during my studies, I worked as a software developer. And um, that maybe kind of sharpens that interest a bit more. So I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between um, power and, uh, uh, and computing in, in particular. When I say computing, I mean everything that's, you know, concerned with, uh, um, you know, everything from processors to uh, gadgets to uh, cables to uh, the fundamentals of uh, mathematical calculation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my main work, I would say, is uh, today um, more conceptual, right? Uh, so I just uh, released a, a, a book called uh, Engines of Order, which uh, you can uh, download for free if you're, if you're inclined to do so. It's pretty much a philosophical, historical take on the emergence of uh, certain, well, what I call algorithmic techniques, right? Stuff like machine learning, text mining, and so forth. Um, but uh, um, I was never just content with looking at that relationship um, only conceptually, right? That con relationship between power and computing, um, because there's a real, uh, there's a real empirical dimension to it. And um, so in my work, I've continued to uh, develop software. Um, as a researcher, I'm part of the Digital Methods Initiative, where we yeah, create tools for the study of online phenomena in, in particular. Um, I'm, and I'm also interested in uh, the empirical work uh, that uh, these tools then allow us, uh, allow us to do indeed uh, to, uh, you know, study, um, well, in my case, uh, large online platforms. Um, but, but maybe to just take, take a step back, uh, uh, you know, when preparing this, uh, this talk, I, <clears throat> I went back to some of the definitions of uh, digital humanities uh, and you know there are all kinds of discussions about like big tent definitions, small tent definitions, should the digital humanities be something very very specific, um, a lot of that would be maybe literary computing or should it be something very broad that you know includes uh, uh, all kinds of humanities work that draws on computing on, in some way or another. 
Um, but these debates, I, I, I think they're, they've become a bit stale. And um, I, I thought as a starting point, I would go uh, to something more uh, uh, concrete. And I looked at, uh, at uh, uh, UVA homepages uh, that uh, deal with, um, deal with uh, uh, digital humanities. And I found these interesting uh, quotes here um, about the Center for Digital Humanities that facilitates so-called embedded research projects in which research questions from the humanities are approached by using techniques and concepts out of the fields of digital humanities. Um, yeah, and I already highlighted the, the, the notion of questions. So which kind of questions do we ask, right? And I wanna spend some time on talking about the questions that I'm particularly interested in. Techniques, right? This is where really the, 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 uh, um, the digital comes, uh, comes in and, and the research I'm gonna show you uses a variety of um, uh, you know, computational techniques to make sense of the, the things I'm, uh, I'm looking at. And, and of course, concepts, right? So, so those are really, um, you know, academic fields that they developed around conceptual vocabulary, ideas, ways of thinking about um, what we're looking at. Uh, in the second quote, um, uh, we it's you know it's not that uh, not that dissimilar, but um, um, here is also the an emphasis on uh, sources, uh, sources and what methods is maybe similar to techniques, but I think the the question of sources is maybe one of the distinguishing criteria between digital humanities and um, um, uh, media studies. Um, and, and media studies, I mean, it's really difficult to summarize. Uh, so, I mean, I think uh, um, you've already done, uh, like most of you have done uh, some courses uh, uh, probably that deal with that question. It, it's a really large field. It's also an eclectic field. I think there are some really important differences, right, uh, between different approaches, different traditions. Um, and there's a lot of variation also between uh, countries. Uh, so there are different research traditions. Um, for example, in France, uh, where I did my PhD, um, the difference between the social sciences and the humanities is much less pronounced than in, for example, the, the Netherlands. But, but I think in most cases, media studies do draw on both of these uh, traditions, the humanities and the, the social sciences. And, and I try to identify here um, four strands, um, strands, I don't know, clusters, uh, you know something quite uh, quite big and, and this is really reductive but just to give you an idea of the kind of work that i think like mainly ca categorizes uh, media studies um you know in some in some departments that there's going to be an emphasis on practical education actually right uh, um you can learn uh, um, web design in in, in some in some uh, departments you can learn uh, movie making right um but from a more research perspective uh, uh, i think uh, yeah what we see is maybe one strand that deals with empirical research looking at contents but also looking at effects of media that's maybe the closest also to um uh, communication studies uh, which is a, a related field which in Amsterdam would be at the social sciences fact, uh, faculty, whereas we're at the, at the humanities faculty. Um, but there's clearly some overlap here. Then the third cluster would be the broad philosophical study of media as cultural agents, right? This is maybe this, um, uh, um, you know, a tradition uh, uh, that uh, starts with McLuhan and, um, you know, continues in many ways. Uh, um, until this uh, day. And then I think there's more specifically historical research in, uh, into the media and media both understood as you know, media institutions like newspapers, you know, uh, particular television channels, but also media understood as technologies, which is maybe what I'm particularly interested in, right? Um, the printing press as a technology, um, uh, the different you know, uh, image and sound recording uh, tech technologies, um, and now, of course, uh, um, uh, computers. Um, what I do think is an important char characteristic for media studies is, is that we're indeed often concerned with questions of the power of the media, right? So this is really where, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the Michel Foucault, uh, who you already saw on screen uh, uh, earlier, comes in, right? Um, um, and uh, a lot of the scholars that are active in media studies are particularly interested in their you know, political and social significance, right? So there's a, a strong focus, particularly these days, right, on this intersection between politics, power and media. Um, and media, I mean, you know, either in the plural or the singular, today uh, means increasingly some kind of computing device or, 
or system, right? Um, when I think about media today, I think on the one side on like hardware and like form factors, uh, like a, you know, a personal computer, a smartphone, Internet of Things. But then I think more and more uh, about the software, right? The interfaces that we are uh, sitting in front of, you know, something like like Facebook is designed in a particular way, um, uh, and so forth. And, and my own interest uh, in this intersection between computing and power kind of focused in the beginning when I wrote uh, my, my PhD, uh, it's already uh, uh, over a decade ago, um, I, I was really interested in search engines. Because in many ways, if you, if you look at this intersection between like power, you know, understood in this media sense and, uh, and computers, um, search engines uh, really appear uh, quite, quite naturally and quite quickly, right? You, you put, uh, uh, um, and maybe let's zoom in here for a second, um, you uh, put a, a search query into a, into a search field and, um, you know, you get some kind of ranked list, some kind of answer, right? And, and there's clearly a political dimension to, uh, to this, right? What gets ranked first? What, uh, what gets ranked second? What is given visibility? What is uh, uh, kept in, uh, in obscurity? Um, and, and maybe today uh, uh, these similar questions uh, are uh, uh, more and more prevalent in the context of uh, social media platforms or social media services um, where uh, uh, we not only have like ranking mechanisms, but, you know, we have ranking when we search, but we also have recommendations. So there's an important place for algorithms within that, but also these larger uh, structural questions about connectivity and so forth play a role here. And there's a real question if we look at something like uh, like this Twitter uh, screenshot here, um, like what kind of politics, right, quite concretely, not necessarily in this, in this broader philosophical sense, but quite concretely, what kind of politics uh, is happening uh, mediated through uh, something like, um, like uh, um, Twitter? And um, that brings us quite quickly to this question of platforms, online platforms. And it's a, it's, it's again, it's a broad term. Um, quite a lot of different disciplines are interested in it. So I've been working quite a bit with uh, economists who define platforms first and foremost as a two-sided markets, right? So, so there are all kinds of um, uh, uh, approaches, but I think in the context of this talk, uh, we're talking about yeah, large-scale infrastructures for exchange and communication. One could add, you know, like, uh, computational infrastructures um, that draw heavily on user contributions, right? Um, and that uh, manage interactions through interfaces, algorithms, and, uh, you know, policies are, I think, becoming increasingly important, particularly around subjects like um, deplatformization, you know, when content or people are, are banned from, cert from certain platforms. Um, and, and I mean, in many ways, you can already see, right? So here I'm kind of like moving to a particular kind of research object, right? Um, and this research object is maybe more specific indeed to media studies um, and not the traditional uh, research object that uh, the digital humanities would maybe deal with. Um, it's clear that if you look at, uh, you know, um, the current uh, state of the art of research is that social media platforms uh, have had important effects on communicative structures, right? And on, on all levels, from like very intimate person-to-person -person communication to, you know, the very, very large, I mean, just think about Facebook uh, with um, uh, over 2 billion uh, monthly active users is, is really quite crazy, right? Um, and, and there are virulent debates uh, about the power of platforms. Uh, algorithms on the one side, misinformation and so forth, right? And um, here are just uh, some, some examples, right? Angela Merkel talking about internet search engine uh, engines uh, that are, according to her, distorting perception. Um, and it was already, uh, you know, some, uh, some, some while ago, but um, these uh, accusations have only become uh, yeah, more, uh, more intense. Um, uh, another example here from the Wall Street Journal, um, an article that argues that YouTube drives people to the internet's darkest corners, right? So, so a lot of these um, anxieties that are being uh, framed have indeed to do with the algorithmic component. What are people, um, you know, uh, uh, recommended uh, in terms of content? What, what is being put into their, 
into you know onto on their screens in, in front of their faces um, and and how can we uh, then research that I that's of course uh, the question for the for the academic um, my, my work in this area currently uh, focuses on a particular platform so um, I've been looking over the last uh, three years quite a bit on uh, on uh, YouTube um, which I think is interesting it's uh, the second most visited uh, uh, page in, on the on the internet um, it's uh, generally also referred to as the second most important search engine on the internet and and I think it's it's I mean I'm I'm, I'm interested for a number of reasons it's it's a platform that I also use uh, um, uh, quite a quite quite a bit um, and um, you know, throughout these debates that I just mentioned, it has really been singled out as a you know potential radicalizer, as you know host to um, uh, particularly far right content, but also all kinds of other things. Um, so it's been really heavily debated, um, but it also hasn't been studied as much as um, as um, for example Twitter or uh, or Facebook. And maybe the last point that really uh, makes it quite fascinating uh, to me um, is, uh, you know, how big some of these channels have become. I mean, here I have a PewDiePie uh, um, uh, on the on the bottom, um, still with uh, 81 million subscribers. He's now way beyond the hundred, right? And and YouTube, in that sense, is in, at the center of what. Uh, Andrew Chadwick uh, called uh, a hybrid media system, right? So it's not necessarily like replacing everything else, but there is hybridization. And I think YouTube is indeed becoming increasingly a, a, a dominant. So Cunningham et al, they call this uh, a new screen ecology that is, um, that is emerging here. Um, part of the work that I'm doing in this context is um, I'm, uh, I'm a member of um, uh, what's called the Observatory on the Online Platform Economy. It's an institution created by the European Commission. Um, and we are kind of looking into, you know, uh, what are the, the, the currently important questions um, concerning uh, uh, online, uh, online platforms. And I just wanted to give you that as a bit of a, of, of a, of a context, right? That this research um, isn't simply, you know, driven by um, my own interests, although, although you know, they... Uh, they clearly play a very important role, but there is also a now interest in looking into how evidence, uh, um, academically uh, collected evidence in particular, can inform uh, things such as uh, uh, regulation, right? So um, there is a kind of like a pathway from that to uh, maybe newer laws, you know, that maybe would alleviate some of the, the problems that I just uh, mentioned. And within that work, I'm, I'm not just doing empirical work. I'm kind of trying to come up with this idea of a, of a platform diagram. So this is more of a, like, a, like a conceptual contribution. It's a, a notion of diagram uh, connects here to, a, to the work of uh, Gilles Deleuze, another uh, French uh, philosopher. And um, um, I'm currently kind of trying to work this into a book proposal. I'm not going to go into details here, but I've got these six levels that I'm kind of looking at, kind of starting with algorithms because also the debate seems to start here, then looking into constructed infrastructures, so, you know, design interfaces, but also then the participants' practices and, and contents, um, the business models, kind of policies that are used, and uh, the larger economic environment. Um, and this is really a topic that I'm also increasingly interested in. But uh, the work that I'm going to be presenting in this talk is uh, mainly about, uh, you know, algorithms and then uh, number three, participants, practices and uh, contents. I mean, there are many, obviously, I mean, you know, something like Facebook, I mean, think about it or YouTube. There are many, many different questions that one that one can ask, right? Um, there are many different approaches and, uh, you know, there, uh, all of these methods have their own histories and, and media studies is, is, is already, you know, quite big. Uh, so there are many different approaches within media studies, but then uh, a lot of other disciplines are interested in, in platforms as well. So, so my empirical work uh, on YouTube actually started by uh, building a tool um, which uh, um, is called the YouTube Data Tools. It's a series of modules. It's basically a means to extract data from, uh, from uh, YouTube and you can try this out uh, yourself. You can either type that in the name into Google or if uh, your teachers share the, the slides uh, uh, with you, uh, it's in the in the in the comment of uh, of these slides, so so there you can uh, uh, you know kind of download a lot of data, play around with it, um, analyze it. Um, 
But um, what's maybe more important from an academic perspective is um, that together with a number of colleagues, um, I have started to develop uh, concrete methodological approaches, right? So not just get some data and do some analysis, but, you know, like thinking about like how to do this. Um, and I'm working with uh, Oscar Coromina um, uh, from uh, Barcelona, Ariana Metamoros uh, uh, Fernandez fr uh, from QUT in Australia, and uh, Eric Bora, uh, uh, more recently, in, uh, who's uh, from our own uh, um, department here at, uh, at the UVA. I mean, I think one of the important uh, distinctions between the digital humanities and, uh, and media studies, I think, is indeed the research objects. And that also means like what kind of sources do we work with? Like what kind of data are we able to retrieve? And um, I think you will see that some of the analytical techniques are actually quite similar, but there are really different problems. I think if you look at, you know, uh, how to uh, how to do research with, um, you know, uh, uh, platforms and, uh, you know, data that you retrieve from there or, you know, a very large number of, um, of uh, uh, you know, uh, novels, uh, for example, which would be a quite a typical example for the digital humanities. Um, in the case of platforms, it can be very difficult to actually get any data, right? Either you have to pay for it, but in general, there has been a, um, less data access after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, so uh, Alex Brunze calls that uh, the, the apocalypse. Um, yeah, and I think our research is, is uh, made possible because we have, um, we have kind of like, like privileged access to YouTube uh, through the YouTube data tools. So uh, um, uh, um, the way a YouTube handles data access is you get some kind of quota, right? And if you create a new project, you get, uh, 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 you know, 20,000 um, quota units uh, uh, per day, which, you know, is already quite, uh, quite something. But we are lucky we still have 50 million uh, per day so we can do uh, things that other research projects currently can't do which is on the one side nice uh, for us uh, but it's also a real problem right because um, um, how can this kind of research that we're doing be reproduced and verified and so forth so in this project or in this kind of like ongoing um, uh, research uh, um, almost uh, yeah maybe more than a project but uh, like um, research group uh, that we're forming here. Uh, our first fo uh, focus was um, the search ranking system, right? So uh, what I named algorithms before, and we wanted to like find out like, how can we say something about this? Like, how does this work, right? Um, and uh, what we did, and here you see, um, you see uh, uh, simply, uh, uh, you know, the, the results for a particular query, uh, Syria. Um, and uh, well, again, we have this familiar structure that um, okay so uh, something is in the in the first place and then we move from there and right we, we all know that the results that are in the first place receive much more visibility are clicked much more often and, and and so forth so so that's kind of the 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 reasoning on on the importance on this and and, and youtube used to talk about some of the factors that they um that they used in uh, their uh, uh, um a search uh, uh, ranking system, but uh, they've since removed that, and those were also just very, very basic um, uh, pieces of information. So, so the methodology that uh, we developed here is um, a quite, quite basically uh, focused on change, right? So we we never really tried to say, okay, let's try to like reverse engineer the different factors. It's pretty clear that. Uh, that the data isn't available for that, but rather let's get a sense of how uh, ranking works. Let's uh, let's look at it over time. Let's visualize it, and this is another tool uh, that I that I built for this uh, project. You can also uh, use that freely. It's called a rank flow, and what you see here is that each column is a day, right? Um, and then uh, the first ranked video is on top. And um, the second rank video is the second one, right? So it's almost like the search page directly transposed. But these connectors that you can see here, they show you movement from day to day. So you can see, for example, that uh, the video um, uh, uh, Islamic State advances is at you know roughly 10 on the first day, then goes up to two on the second, and then goes down again on the third day before uh, disappearing. So what we did was we said, okay, let's select a number of um, search queries and, you know, and you've got the, 
the paper um, uh, that uh, it came out of this. Uh, so, so you hopefully know this, right? We selected a number of queries, and then and then we um, looked uh, for about seven uh, seven weeks into um, into uh, these uh, uh, queries, and uh, those are just three uh, examples. Uh, GamerGate, which was at this point already a bit of a like stale controversy. Then indeed Syria, where you can see this flipping between almost like two modes, right? You see in the beginning, there are very small um, uh, um, rectangles here, which means videos that don't have a lot of views. Then suddenly we have much bigger ones coming and going back before again stabilizing, right? Um, and the last one is uh, uh, Trump, which was really quite impressive. So this was um, in 2016, in the summer, right? So, so just during the election campaign, um, and here during the seven weeks, there was no video um, that stayed longer in the top 20 than four days, right? So, so very quick uh, turnaround. And indeed, we tried to um, describe these uh, three things as, you know, morphologies, particularly like forms, stable over long periods of time, stable with newsy interruptions, and then newsy queries that change constantly. Um, we also used um, a, uh, a metric, um, uh, rank-based distance that comes from information science, um, which basically gives you a, like a metric of changiness, right? So um, it takes into account whether something falls out or changes in place. Um, and so we were able also to quantify uh, change uh, or well, changiness uh, as, we, uh, as we called it here. Um, Interesting, I think, is that uh, um, the stable periods and the more agitated periods didn't necessarily have the same type of, of video. So the, the stable periods had like bigger channels and more traditional stuff, right? Uh, like stuff like, uh, you know, comedy or explainer videos. Whereas during agitated periods, it's kind of like native YouTube channels popped in uh, uh, very strongly, although uh, they had much fewer uh, subscribers. And, and the way we looked at it, we didn't just want to quantify things, but we really looked into what kind of videos were put forward. And what this pointed us towards was this idea of platform vernacular, right? This idea that, um, that um, behind different queries are different kind of cultures, right? Different, um, different video producers, different uh, forms of making videos, different styles, but then also different kind of audiences. Um, and and uh, we really noticed that um, maybe that this larger YouTube culture in intersected with these more specific like query or subject cultures that were behind our our queries. Um, and I mean, we did, I think, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, we were able to um, to make some inferences, right? We, we noticed, for example, that there's a correlation between like changiness, the number of videos published, and we were also able to look into, uh, via Google Trends, into search volume, right? So this seems when, when uh, for a query, more videos are published and more people search, then there is more change, right? Bringing in these uh, uh, native YouTube actors. Um, but in the end, we, we really um, um, thought that the term algorithm here is simply not enough. It, it's, this is not just an investigation of a you know, fully contained technical system. No, it's something that's distributed, right? Um, the way ranking operates may be very technical, but, but what is being put to the front, what is you know, in people's faces, depends on the interaction between that technical system and uh, uh, use practices. So we came up with that term ranking cultures that combine, you know, that combine uh, the technical with the social and, and we, you know, had a, a, like a number of, um, of, of methods that I already talked about and tried to, you know, co uh, um, uh, connect these. What we weren't able, I think, is to really draw them apart, right? Saying this is the social component, this is the technical component. Um, probably that, that actually doesn't make, uh, make any sense. Um, and, and this, I think, pushed us really uh, to, um, to question the, the general notion of algorithm within that. I mean, not that the, not that the, um, the term is, um, is useless, but, um, um, you know, there, there is quite some critique now forming around it. Ian Bogost, for example, says that concepts like algorithm has, have become sloppy shorthands, slang terms for the act of mistaking multi-part complex systems for simple singular ones, right? 
um, because even the technical factors are not many more at right? the interfaces, the way data are structured and so forth, right? Um, and, and we were more and more interested in something like, yeah, what you could call the state of the full system, right? How can we describe, how can we not just like reverse engineer some technical factors, but how can we kind of overall describe like what's happening on YouTube, right? Um, what is the outcome of mediatization? Um, where we include all of these things and then look at the and look at the end uh, the end product. Um, so so that led us to the question like what can we even say about YouTube empirically? Um, it's it's obviously almost impossible to look inside of the machine, and and so what kind of knowledge can we uh, generate? And and that I think uh, led us to um, um, a second approach uh, that um, in a sense is 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 much more simplistic. Um, the project was called the Mapping YouTube, and it's also the name of the first paper uh, that's uh, that uh, already came out, and which uh, hopefully uh, you uh, you uh, were able to read. Um, we really asked the basic question: so, so what is on YouTube? Not just you know what's what's being put in front by the system, but what what's just there? And, and that's actually a, a question that, for media scholars, in the past was relatively easy to answer. So imagine, you know, if, uh, so for example, one of the papers that, uh, that I wrote when I was a, an undergrad uh, was about, um, about uh, a yearly, you know, a, a year of uh, um, publications of a particular far right um, a journal that I was analyzing at that time, right? And, and, and there wasn't just much out there, right? You could simply like buy the newspaper, buy the magazine. Uh, the number of um, television channels uh, was relatively small, so you you could quite easily know what is out there. But today, it's very hard to know what kind of contents are uh, are out there. So 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 that was um, a kind of the starting point, and and we wanted to inquire into different the themes, you know, like what kind of subjects are being treated, like the structure of YouTube, question of reception as far as you can, monetization. Uh, I think this this uh, particularly this um, like media industrial perspective it more and more interests us because the uh, um, you know uh, that YouTube from the beginning had the um, the policy to share uh, to share um, a revenue advertising revenue with the uh, content creators so from the beginning there was really like a, a vector of professionalization uh, and I think that's uh, really really quite uh, quite important uh, nowadays. So here is, you see some of the theoretical uh, references from uh, media studies uh, that uh, we were drawing on. And um, uh, from a, a more empirical perspective, we were drawing uh, particularly on uh, uh, John Tukey, who actually uh, uh, is a very famous statistician of the 20th century. Um, he's also very famous for coining the word uh, software. Um, and he, he, uh, he introduced this term exploratory data analysis where the idea is really to not necessarily start without questions, right? But maybe rather, yeah, something like research intuitions that you then confront with the data and try to really see what the, what the data um, uh, uh, tells you. Um, and, and I think this is really something that um, um, brings us much closer to that space of the digital humanities. I think both in, in terms of um, an, um, uh, trying to characterize like a like a large ensemble of things, right? That the term uh, macro analysis that Matthew Jocker introduced uh, um, really talks about like how you can analyze like large numbers of literary uh, productions, um, and uh, you know also famously uh, uh, Franco Moretti um, also uh, uh, introduced a similar term, uh, distant reading, for thinking about ah. Um, you know, in opposition to this uh, literary analysis uh, technique, close reading, how can you, you know, read from a distance and thereby um, um, uh, maybe take into account much, much larger amounts of, um, of uh, uh, um, you know, units, uh, in our case, that would be uh, YouTube channels, right, or YouTube videos instead of uh, uh, novels. Um, but then also you can see already here uh, on these uh, two, um, um, uh, book uh, book covers that uh, um, the techniques used here are, 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 are you know kind of like network analysis uh, style uh, uh, tools and uh, this is something that um, yeah is also actually really the starting point for our approach um, so we looked at um, oh let's zoom in here um, we looked at uh, 
uh, uh, crawling as a particular kind of methodology. Um, uh, uh, crawling has been used in in uh, uh, different uh, uh, disciplines, uh, computer science, information science, but also in, in media studies, uh, 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 quite a bit, right? For example, web crawling is you try to um, you try to uh, uh, you start maybe with a set of websites and then you follow hyperlinks and thereby you try to like map uh, the particular web space that is maybe occupied by a certain issue. Um, there's also uh, there are crawler tools for uh, for YouTube. Uh, actually, YouTube data tools um, uh, also have a, um, a, a crawling component. Um, but um, yeah, we said let's try to uh, to make this uh, uh, big. Um, there are a number of existing approaches to like characterizing like all of YouTube because this was ultimately our goal, right? I mean. We always knew that uh, we're not going to be able to you know, literally get everything, but, but the goal was to try, right? Um, and uh, uh, the existing approaches have really quite some uh, limitations. Um, and we said, let's try and go beyond them, right? So what we did was we implemented a, a breadth first crawl, right? That's, uh, uh, you know, you, you move in like onion layers uh, uh, rather than, you know, going for depth first. Um, using subscriber number numbers as a, a cutoff, uh, we started from a single seed. There's a lot of discussion uh, of that in the in the paper, um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so this is implemented in uh, in uh, Python. Some some serious engineering going into this uh, uh, was really interesting to do, and we did three um, three crawls uh, also to check a bit, you know, what is our method missing, um, and in the end, then we had a. Well, a pretty large number of uh, of uh, YouTube channels that um, that uh, we uh, analyzed. Um, just to maybe give a bit of a footnote here um, uh, for analysis work, uh, I'm now uh, using a lot of um, uh, Jupyter uh, Jupyter notebooks, which are really really helpful, uh, um, and you can actually use them with um, with uh, Visual Studio Code uh, for those of you who are programmers. Uh, it's uh, much much nicer than the, the pretty crappy web interface they have. Uh, so, uh, um, but Jupyter Notebooks is really great, uh, especially if you have large data files because you can keep them in memory and then query them. Uh, yeah, uh, just just a footnote uh, for the more technically inclined. Um, the outcome of our paper or of of our crawl actually was yeah this uh, channel hierarchy and here you can see a little bit the size of our sample. So we retrieved uh, over thirty six million. Uh, channels uh, and then uh, you know for the uh, the, the, the the top uh, uh, um, what we call the elite right uh, the channels that have uh, more than a hundred thousand uh, subscribers so 150 thousand 153 thousand channels that have more than a hundred thousand subscribers we also got all of the video data we made samples for the for the lower ones and um, I mean interestingly these tiers that we identified they also really correspond to how uh, YouTube governs these things, right? So if you um, have more than a hundred, uh, sorry, more than a thousand subscribers, you're able to put advertisements on your videos, right? If you move over a hundred thousand, you get your own um, like uh, 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 direct contact at YouTube uh, uh, and so forth, right? So um, so these are really things that um, that have uh, some real importance uh, within uh, uh, YouTube itself. Um, and, and, you know, I don't want to like summarize all of the findings, just give you a couple of ideas, summarize maybe the things that are, are most interested, interesting to us. Um, and, and maybe actually before going into some of the details, I just want to say that I think one of the most interesting things are the like new questions that we um, bumped into, right? Um, there are many, many open questions uh, that, uh, that remain and, and actually that process was quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, if you want to look uh, more closely into the, the numbers here, you have that in the paper. You can also zoom in a bit. Um, but maybe just, just very basically, in terms of distributions, um, we found that YouTube indeed uh, uh, is really highly unequal, right? And, and here um, I'm using the term platform media system, which until now I actually haven't used. I just want to give you an idea what, what, uh, what I mean by that. It's this idea that um, what happens within YouTube is really something different than what happens on Netflix. So, uh, uh, you know, Netflix has full editorial control on everything they're doing. But YouTube, you know, still has this like influx of 
you know, random, not, not random, but, you know, um, uh, creators that, uh, you know, are not professionals and, and you can open your own uh, YouTube channel. And out of this grows a, a media system that, that, you know, also has its, its, its particular characteristics, has a particular structure, has, you know, differences in size, has these differences in terms of uh, equality of, for example, you know, subscriber numbers, views and so forth. And we're kind of thinking about um, this platform media system as something that emerges a little bit like the ranking as, you know, part due to YouTube's governance and part due to the uh, contents that um, uh, uh, well, people are bringing to the system, uploading and so forth. And it's really quite skewed, right? So one of the, I think the most interesting findings is that the elite channels in our sample, those are the, those are the 153,000 channels that have more than 100,000 subscribers. Uh, so they are only 0.4% of our sample. So less than 1% of all of the channels we looked at, but they have 69 of all the percent of all the subscriptions and 62% of all the views within, uh, within our, um, within our uh, uh, sample. So, so, you know, that's, that's pretty skewed, right? Um, and if we move up even further, the, uh, there are about uh, a little bit more than 15,000 channels that have more than a million subscribers. So 0.04% uh, of our sample. And they still have about 37% of the subscribers and 37% of the views, right? So more than a third. Um, and these channels, uh, uh, yeah, are really, um, you know, the, 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 the well-known ones. Um, um, yes. Um, there's, of course, a much more... Uh, much more data in the in the paper. I mean, I think the second direction that we looked at um, was uh, categories, right? And and this categorization comes from YouTube itself, right? So maybe in the digital humanities, one would uh, do work that is um, on a, on a less structured object in most cases, I would think, right? So before I said that it's difficult to get data from the platforms and depending on the platform, that can be very true. Um, but once you get the data, it's actually quite rich. There's a lot of metadata there, right, that we can use. And that data is also very high quality. Um, so this uh, is uh, our the actual uh, YouTube categories and how they're distributed. And you can see that lifestyle and entertainment in particular are really dominating uh, the you know, the what is out there uh, of uh, YouTube, music, gaming coming in uh, second and society and sports being much, much, uh, much, much smaller, right? And maybe in the digital humanities, this is something that one would do in a more emergent fashion, maybe based on textual analysis, um, trying to create a topic model of uh, what's on there. And this is actually something that we want to do in a, in a further paper. Here, uh, really quick, um, we also looked into how um, categories relate to each other. Um, meaning that uh, uh, channels can be part of more than one category. And, um, uh, you know, if you say that, okay, a channel uh, is, um, you know, tagged with two categories, that means that these categories are related. And from there, we can create this network visualization where you can see that, for example, the society category here in this kind of like, like matte red um, uh, is, is actually quite spread out, whereas the others are, um, are much more closely uh, uh, um, uh, together and I think it also gives you a good idea what uh, um, YouTube is bringing uh, to um, to uh, uh, its um, you know to the the structuring of this platformed uh, media system um, and maybe the third cluster of results uh, was on countries because every um, every channel can be flagged with a particular country uh, uh, country uh, code it doesn't have to and you can see in this um, in this uh, bar chart here on the left it's not available so actually um, um, about 23 percent of the elite channels so this is elite channels um, uh, were not tagged uh, with any country uh, um, but this was actually quite interesting because if you look at the us graph just you know the second one here you can see that the uh, percentage of channels in our sample that you know come from the US. It's about a little less than sixteen percent, but they have a much higher subscriber count, right? Almost twenty percent subscriber count, over twenty percent view count, and actually a much smaller video count. So those are these three colors, right? Blue, orange, green, and red. And you can see the blue, you know, 
and then going up to orange green and then going down uh, to red and that means that um, the US is highly successful at uh, gaining subscribers and views with fewer videos actually so on a per video basis they're much more successful and we found similar patterns also a little bit uh, for other lang uh, English language uh, speaking countries like uh, Great Britain or uh, or uh, uh, Canada right uh, a, a really fun uh, uh, case here is uh, is um, is I think um, uh, uh, South Korea which in, in general is, is, is really interesting due to the the prevalence of uh, k-pop uh, so if we look at uh, at uh, this uh, this chart here, um, uh, we see uh, uh, South Korea on the on the on the tep, uh, top left, um, and what this plots right is scatter plot um, is uh, so a lot of information here in in one single uh, chart. The size of the bubbles is um, the average subscribers per channel. So you can see, for example, that um, uh, uh, the U.S. has a has pretty large from all countries here the largest average number of subscribers per channel India also tends towards very big channels Brazil um, and then the two axes are on the bottom the mean intensity intensity for us is uh, is um, the relationship between views and stuff like comments and likes right because you can have a video that is viewed a lot right but doesn't receive many doesn't retrieve uh, uh, sorry doesn't receive uh, many reactions um, and that is what intensity uh, 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 um, uh, expresses and on the left uh, you see the mean like ratio that means the ratio between likes and dislikes so what you can see is that Brazil, which in general is, is you know, is, is really doing its own, uh, its own thing uh, on YouTube and, uh, and elsewhere, has the highest intensity and is the most positive country on, on YouTube. Uh, South Korea is much less uh, uh, intensity, but also uh, very positive, right? Uh, uh, K-pop, uh, whereas India and Pakistan uh, down there are the, the angriest countries that we were able to identify. I mean, all of this now, requires of course much more interpretation we do some of that in the paper but uh, this is also really um, a follow-up work and and speaking of follow-up work we in this paper we already started to look into monetization uh, a bit and um, um, yeah this is something that uh, we're as I said already are particularly interested in um, there has been a lot of debate about um, the adpocalypse or so another not the apocalypse, api calypse, but the adpocalypse, um, where um, um, uh, advertisers are retreated from uh, YouTube after their ads were um, featured on um, uh, content that they didn't approve of, and um, uh, that led uh, then you know to a to a lot of changes of advertising policies, and you know content creators were quite uh, quite uh, affected by that, and. Um, the kind of research that we started here tries to look a little bit into this relationship between like monetization and creator practices. So on the on the top here, you can see um, the average video duration and how that has changed over the years. Right uh, now, you can um, place two sets of ads uh, on videos if it's longer than ten minutes. Right, you can see uh, the march towards ten minutes is quite important here. And we also looked at um, um, the number of Patreon uh, uh, URLs in the video descriptions. So Patreon is um, a crowdfunding website and a lot of the creators that are not able, I mean, not only them, but particularly them who are uh, the creators that are not able to make revenue through advertisement because maybe they deal with complicated uh, subjects and um, controversial subjects uh, possibly also important subjects possibly um, because they are uh, uh, often demonetized they need to look for um, for other revenues and and there's really quite an emergence uh, here to just uh, close up this uh, presentation of uh, this empirical work um, so our next projects are a full paper on monetization and i've already talked about uh, categorization so we want to um, uh, try out machine le machine learning approaches for a different kind of topic mapping of um, of uh, YouTube and I, th I think here particularly uh, the work from digital humanities which I think is more focused on you know stuff like uh, trying to deal with 
maybe topic um, emergent categorizations is going to come in helpful. Um, and indeed, um, yeah, uh, for the monetization aspect, uh, we're particularly interested in monetization and optimization tactics, right? So what are uh, uh, video creators doing? And then kind of trying to create this picture of industrialization. So I've already you not know, talked about Patreon URLs, but uh, here you have uh, uh, two examples uh, of uh, uh, video descriptions. And these hyperlinks are, are going to be um, one of the main material that we're going to work with, right? Um, so where do they point to? Uh, and here you have a, a first result. I actually uh, ran this script uh, uh, while uh, while preparing this talk, and uh, the the code is actually the one that you saw on the on the second uh, or the third slide. Uh, and you can already see, you know, in terms of numbers, we were able to retrieve. 570 million URLs. And here you see some of the distributions, right? You see a uh, YouTube in the top, then you have two, um, two uh, URL shorteners uh, that we will have to translate. That's gonna be a lot of work. And then you can see, you know, the, the usual um, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, social media. Then relatively quickly, we st see stuff like Amazon uh, uh, down there. Um, uh, Patreon, I already mentioned that. So, so real uh, attempts at uh, monetization. Um, yeah, so that's really something that we still have to um, still have to uh, uh, analyze in, in much more depth. But I mean, those are just some, you know, kind of first steps, um, first attempts to draw uh, a somewhat selective picture of a large scale online platform, right. And um, um, I think in something like this, since we never have like full access, we need um, different lines of inquiry, right? Um, uh, I think this image here is a bit of a metaphor for this, right? Every, t every perspective that we look from shows us a quite different picture and we need to bring together all of the different perspectives uh, to, um, to make sense of this really complex object. Um, but maybe more generally to conclude on, you know, I've commented a number of times on the relationship between media studies and the digital humanities. And, and maybe the main difference between, um, you know, what we call digital methods or computational methods in media studies and the digital humanities is the research object, right? Um, rather than working with digitized sources, which is very often still the case in uh, in uh, uh, the digital humanities, we study what Richard Rogers called natively digital objects, right? A, a platform doesn't have an off offline equivalent. And the kind of data we get um, is really very much tied into the, the, the digital architecture of, of that thing. Um, of course, you know, there are many different uh, uh, projects and research directions in the digital humanities. So uh, not everybody is, um, is uh, uh, studying uh, like literary works or other digitized uh, 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 sources, but I think this is maybe a, a big um, a big difference. Um, but then I think you noticed maybe that the methods that um, uh, we applied here are are really quite uh, quite similar. I mean, we have some different data, and 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 you know maybe we have to do much less data cleaning. Uh, uh, on the one side, but maybe we have like larger amounts of data. So the YouTube stuff that 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 I presented here, the, the, the mapping, the mapping YouTube project, that's really huge. So running once through the whole data set uh, can take uh, a day or two, right? Um, but then the, the methods are still quite similar, right? We're using a lot of statistics, uh, uh, we're using network analysis, we're using natural language processing, which as I said, you know, is maybe more of an expertise of the digital humanities. Um, but that also means that the technical skills that are behind all of this are highly transferable. Right uh, between the two fields, um, you can easily, you know, uh, what you learned in digital, digital humanities apply to media studies research and vice uh, vice versa. Uh, uh, and and you know, if you can, my recommendation would be to try and learn Python. It's um, I mean, there's a steep learning curve, but it's a great it's a great programming language. Uh, um, I, I just I I mean, one of the reasons why I do this work is I love programming. I really enjoy it as a as a, as a practice, and it's it's you know if you if you can, you know, hold on and you take the time to do it, it's something that, um, you know, never leave, leaves you throughout uh, the rest of, uh, of your life. Um, maybe the second main difference, and this is where I want to conclude, is uh, that media studies research is generally characterized by um, a focus on the present, right? Um, 
of course, there is historical research, but particularly when it comes to this relationship between media, technology and power, we're very much focusing on the present and on social and political questions, right? Um, so, you know, you saw how I, I used the uh, social controversy around platforms and YouTube as my way into, uh, into these uh, uh, projects. But, but I do think that um, um, the digital humanities are, are very quickly moving into that direction as well, right? So uh, digital humanities scholars like David Barry or uh, Alan Liu are indeed pushing for what they call critical digital humanities, right? And, and this would be maybe uh, um, uh, um, a, a field that, for example, I would also be um, a very comfortable to be a, a part of. Um, uh, and Liu, he says, uh, digital hum humanists will need to find ways to show that thinking critically about metadata, for instance, uh, scales into thinking critically about power, finance, and our other governance protocols of the world, right? And and I could not agree more, right? So this is really literally the kind of gesture that uh, that uh, I'm, uh, yeah, that my work and then I'm just very interested in, right? Um, and and I mean. Just a last uh, last uh, point here, maybe. I mean, you know, we're living uh, during uh, COVID times. Uh, uh, um, it's uh, a month uh, towards uh, the U.S. elections, right? Uh, uh, where uh, you know, questions like mis misinformation, conspiracy theories are uh, are are floating around, and, and it's it's so clear that platforms uh, play a very very important role um, uh, in in this contemporary world, right? And and now, independent of the question whether we call it digital humanities or we call it media studies or we call it computational social science or you know uh, uh, whatever i think what we do need uh, are humanities scholars that uh, both have the critical mindset um, but also the the technical culture uh, to mobilize um, uh, you know empirical evidence and um, uh, uh, you know be at the same time capable of working with the digital and being uh, um, uh, critical about it um, yeah, so uh, that's uh, that's it uh, uh, for my uh, for my lecture. I'm, I'm really sorry that I can't be with you uh, uh, live because I'm 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 just teaching uh, on the on the uh, same day. But uh, maybe our paths will uh, cross in some in some uh, other way. So thanks a lot, and um, yeah, uh, good luck uh, with uh, the rest uh, of your uh, course. Bye bye.